And we'll conclude our time of prayer this morning with our words for illumination. So if you'll join me with those before our scripture reading. Lord, you open the meaning of the scriptures to the disciples on the road to Emmaus and set their hearts ablaze. By the power of your spirit, kindle our hearts as we hear your word proclaimed that we may receive you with joy. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Acts. We pick up in chapter 3, and this is verse 12. There we go. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name himself, itself has made this man strong, whom you see now, excuse me, who you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out so the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, it is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Amen. All right. Our gospel reading comes from the same author as Acts. We're in Luke's gospel this morning. And this is chapter 24, beginning in verse 36. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is, it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The word of God for the people of God. I want you to imagine a couple scenarios this morning. I want you to imagine being married 13, 14, 15, even 20 years or more, thinking that things are generally pretty good between you and your spouse. There are occasional ups and downs like you have in every marriage. 
And then one day out of the blue, your spouse comes to you and says, I filed for divorce. After the shock wears off, you try marriage counseling for a time. You try to patch things up to understand what the problem is, but nothing seems to work. A year later, you're divorced. Some of you may not have to imagine it. For some of you or someone you know, this may be a reality. Or imagine working for a large multinational corporation for many years, giving your time and your effort and your ingenuity, your thinking to this large, secure, wealthy corporation, believing that you'll always be needed, such a fine employee as yourself. But then you're in your mid-50s, and the corporation alters its organizational structure so that one Friday afternoon, without any warning, You receive a letter informing you that in less than a month, your services will no longer be needed. The news leaves you contemplating unemployment for the first time in your life. You feel unwanted, rejected, bitter, without any hope. Just when you were prepared to put the icing on a productive career and coast into a leisurely and much-deserved retirement, you find yourself out on the street, overskilled, in a sluggish economy. Some of you may not have to imagine it. For some of you or someone you know, this may be reality. Imagine you or your spouse retired, living quietly between trips to various vacation spots and spoiling your grandchildren. And one day your only child returns home from an annual physical exam with the news that she has breast cancer. Everyone in the family swings into action, start researching the disease, you determine a best course for treatment with the doctors, you ask for prayer and support, but despite your best efforts, within 12 months, your beloved child is gone, leaving you feeling lost and angry and forsaken. Both the fun and meaning seem drained from your life. Whereas time on planet Earth used to be blissful and eternal, it now seems like incarceration. Some of you may not have to imagine it. For some of you, or someone you know, this could be reality. One last example. Imagine that for one reason or another, you've moved to a new town or city. You left behind friends and neighbors, maybe family, but also all the routines, School, church, favorite restaurants, the mechanic you can trust not to rip you off when your car needs work. In your new home, you have no friends, just a handful of acquaintances. Your neighborhood seems cold and distant. The grocery store doesn't carry your favorite coffee or the particular kind of ice cream you really enjoy. People talk funny around you. You speak your, spend your time Grieving for the simple moments over conversation at your kitchen table. You can't find anything good to say about your new home. It hardly feels like home at all. It feels like someone else's home and that you don't belong there. Some of you may not have to imagine it. For someone you know, maybe for yourself, this could be a reality. I could go on and on like this for a long time, illustration after illustration. It's such a common human experience. Things seem to be humming along just fine, and then without warning, your world is turned upside down, and disaster strikes. One of the most overlooked details in the biblical story of creation, which we're going to be looking at on Wednesday evening, by the way, is that the world begins in chaos. Disaster and disorder are the given of creation because in the beginning, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered over the face of the deep. We often assume that order can be found in the very beginning, but order is part of the process of creation. During the six days of creation, not only are the things of creation made, but they're also brought into an ordered system. A greater light shines in the daytime, a lesser light shines at night. 
The dry land is separated from the water. Living things all have their distinct and appropriate place to be. Water for the fishes. Dry land for the plants and animals and humans. The air for the birds. It all begins to make sense. It works so nicely, but it's not original. Order comes out of the work of creation. If you think about it, all of us spend considerable parts of our weeks bringing order into the lives that we've been given. We protect ourselves and buffer ourselves from the darkness of chaos, which always seems to lie just beneath the surface of God's created order. And by a variety of methods, family, work, recreation, money, to name a few, we attempt to keep chaos as predictable and safe as possible. We work on family relationships, believing that they'll bring emotional fulfillment. We throw ourselves into work, hoping to be rewarded with money and respect. We pursue hobbies and avocations, thinking they'll make us better people or they'll fill voids in our lives. And we gather as much wealth as we can, fooled into believing that at a certain point, life can be completely carefree. Yet however we choose to order our lives, that order will at some point break apart. No family's loving enough. No secure job is secure enough. No amount of money is great enough to distance us from any given chaos. Family relationships often disappoint. We may find ourselves in a dead-end job or be laid off or downsized. Money really solves nothing because each income bracket comes with its own problems and challenges. Our consumerist society is fueled by an assumption that financial security is all important, but chaos happens. Whether we're rich or poor, young or old, living in the city, the suburb, or out in the boonies, our carefully ordered existence will at some point disintegrate, resulting in disorder. Our faith tells us that these moments of chaos, which follow the collapse of order, are like an experience of crucifixion. And just as Jesus didn't seek the cross, praying in the garden, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, neither do we seek chaos. It's painful. We suffer in it. It feels like we've died. But the fact that Jesus endured the cross tells us something very important. It tells us that God is not only in the order but God is also present in the chaos. When our lives are being built up, God is with us. Bless you. And when our lives fall apart, when we crash, God is with us as well. Out of the death, a new creation is born. But only if true death occurs... The old must die, be gone, buried, no more, ended, finished. The Christian community is not a self-improvement society where we work to get just a little bit better each day of our lives. We are a community where we are prepared for things to get ugly. We are prepared for things to get nasty. We are no strangers to death. Neither do we fear it, because out of death emerges new life. As slowly and quietly as dawn emerges on a still spring morning, so the new life, a new order, a new creation emerges out of the chaos. John writes in Revelation, and then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, a new creation, For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Out of every chaos, God creates an order. The first creation constructed out of a given chaos became seriously flawed. The second creation, born out of the experience of taking up a cross, gives us hope. No wonder Jesus tells his disciples in this morning's gospel that they need to spread the word. They need to take the message to all people in every nation. He stands among them that day as resurrected, as on the other side 
of the chaos. He stands as a new creation and by his living presence declares, nay proclaims, there is life and there is hope and you have to tell people. The mystery and miracle of Jesus' resurrection should be as fresh in our minds as it was for the apostles. Because together, we have witnessed the events that were both necessary and inevitable for the fulfillment of God's redeeming love. As children of God, our Creator made in His image, we are filled with wonder and blessing at the awesome reality of our being. We know this is to be true in our deepest parts. And yet, we're challenged to live as children of God. We struggle with living up to this seemingly awesome task. Is it as complicated as we tend to make it? And what I mean is that everything we need to live like children of God is knit into our very fabric, even though it's not always evident by us or our actions. In our reading from Acts, Peter, who once denied knowing Jesus, is witness to the healing power of the resurrection. And his witness prevents those who had rejected Jesus from being able to imagine anything other than Christ's life-giving healing power in the resurrection. The evidence of his own transformation is clearly understood by his compassionate response to those who may have persecuted Jesus. Peter tells them, that it could only have been done in ignorance. And who would know better than he? What we know about Peter is as incredibly convicting today as it must have been for the early Christians who knew Peter, especially the other disciples. He walked with Jesus. He was one of his chosen apostles, and yet he was able to deny even knowing Jesus for fear that he might lose his own life. Yet it was the fulfillment in Jesus resurrected that Peter truly believed and ultimately would die for. Throughout the different accounts of the disciples realizing Jesus' presence in the upper room, without Thomas, then with Thomas present, last week on the road to Emmaus, we understand how they came to believe. Their witness to these events was written down so that we might believe in and witness to the incredible gift of the risen Christ in our own lives as God's children without the need to physically have been there ourselves. The gospel is the only evidence that we need. It provides the foundation for our faith. It holds the mystery of faith and prompts us to search out our understanding of God's creation. But what does it mean for us to live as children of God, knowing that we've been made in his image? The gift of our being doesn't always match up with the way that we live. We're not always willing to bear witness to Jesus' death and resurrection? What keeps us from sharing what we believe with everyone we meet? I mean, after all, aren't they made from the same fabric in God's image? Maybe we fit into the lukewarm category and we aren't fully convinced, let alone passionate enough to share what it is we believe. Maybe it's hard for us to look at our neighbor and allow ourselves to imagine they're made from the same stuff as we are in the same image of our Creator. We're living in a time when it's absolutely critical to conduct ourselves according to the two greatest commandments, to love our Creator God and to love one another. The church in the 21st century, and particularly in our nation, is in a time of great transition and flux, which always includes fear and anxiety. This change will affect us in all our corporate relationships within the church and in the world. And make no mistake, treating each person as a brother and sister in Christ now is the only way to create the sacred space where the Holy Holy Spirit's presence can be genuinely seen and felt. It is in this way that we have an opportunity to experience the risen Christ standing among us even today, and live as children of God.
In our passage from Luke this morning, there's Jesus standing among his closest friends, the disciples. It's meant to represent us, by the way. And he says, Shalom, which is loosely translated to come across as peace be with you. But it's an unfortunate and inadequate attempt to put shalom into English (laughs) because shalom means much more than peace, or maybe it's that peace means much more than what we think it means. Since shalom means to convey that all is well in the world, all is just and all is fair and all is the way that God means it to be, it ultimately means something more like What are you doing to make the world look more like God's world than Caesar's world? With Caesar standing in for whatever the principalities and powers of a given era are. The empires, the rulers, the governments, the multinational corporations, the markets, organized religion, whatever you like. And appropriately, the disciples are startled. The dead one is on the loose. They're terrified because now here he is and he still has shalom on his mind. He always has, he always will, he always does. So Jesus asked the disciples, why are you frightened? Could it be because the last time we saw you, you were dead, hanging on a Roman cross, surrounded by soldiers, angry people as well? And as far as we know, or knew at least, Dead was dead? Well, he seems to say that that's true enough because he offers for them to look at his wounds, to see his hands and his feet. And upon examining them, seeing that his hands and feet have had nails, spikes really, driven through them, we read that the disciples are filled with joy, still tinged with disbelief. They think he might be a ghost. But nevertheless, there's joy. And then this very real Jesus steps forward and he says, have you anything to eat? Didn't he always say you have to come to God's kingdom like a child? And how many times a day do children look at their parents and say, I'm hungry. When are we going to eat? Apparently, As it is in real life, so it is in the resurrection of the dead. We need something to eat. We need something to sustain us, something to nourish us. And so does Jesus. And he wants us to feed him. So how are we to respond to his simple yet direct request? The disciples offer some broiled fish. Jesus is hungry. He wants something to eat. They give him fish. He eats the fish. But perhaps we need to pay attention to what happens next. We read that he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. That is what was referred to as the law and the prophets, the Hebrew scriptures, the Torah. This suggests that perhaps his hunger is not for fish, or not for bread, not for wine. Jesus is hungry post-resurrection, but he was hungry before the resurrection as well. We would do well to consider the source of his hunger before we're so quick to offer him something to satisfy it. And an in-depth understanding of Torah and the prophets is a wonderful place to start. You see, Jesus was vexed with his contemporary religionists. He felt that the application of the Torah, the application of the law and the prophets had gone off in a direction not of God's intent or God's liking. Instead of bringing God's people, all people together, the administration, the understanding of God's 638 rules, beginning with the first 10 that we know as the commandments, was being used to separate people more than to bring them together. This vexation made Jesus hungry, hungry for freedom, for shalom, for justice for all people. Not some people, not most people, not lots of people, all people. Had he not made it clear that the hungry were to be fed, 
the naked clothed, the prisoner visited, the sick made well, the stranger, the resident alien, as the Bible calls them, welcomed, the thirsty given something to assuage their thirst. Had he not self-identified with all these people, including the lepers and the women and the orphans and the children and the servants and the Gentiles and the Jews alike? In a church that's increasingly consumed with power struggles within and without, a church looking for the next great public relations scheme to attract people, a church consumed with dividing everyone into correct and incorrect categories, a church consumed with parking between the lines, is it too difficult to see that Jesus, who promises that he is the stranger, He is the prisoner. He is the leper. He is the beggar on the street. He is the prostitute. He is the sinner. He is the woman who's bleeding to death. He is the mother or father begging for their child's life. He is the tax collector. A Jesus who endlessly teaches about our relationship to the land and the earth and countless agricultural stories, parables, and allegories. A Jesus who challenges every sovereign, temporal, and religious power. Is it too difficult to see that having been raised from being dead and gone three days and now returned back to us for all eternity, that this Jesus, whom we are to proclaim in all that we do and all that we say, wants something more than a piece of broiled fish when he asks, have you anything to eat? Repentance, says Jesus. Repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed to all nations, all persons, Beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. Are we really witnesses of these things? These things that Jesus is hungry for. Jesus, Luke says, is hungry. The risen Lord, blessed be his name, is hungry. What in the world are we prepared to offer him? What in the world are we willing to give him? How shall our witness satisfy his hunger? Is it possible that his shalom is not a greeting after all? Is it rather a request? Is it a command? Are we prepared to give this shalom that he speaks of and died for? Or... Are we still satisfied to just offer him a piece of broiled fish? On this side of the eternal chaos of sin and death, standing on the very edge of a new heaven and a new earth, Jesus is hungry. He wants us to be hungry too. How we respond will determine if his hunger is satisfied. If we're completely honest with ourselves, we know exactly what it will take. And we have these great 50 days of Easter to begin. Fellow sinners, hallelujah. Christ is risen. Fellow saints, the Lord is risen indeed. And he's hungry. Amen. Amen.